and welcome back to Friday Reads, where we help you find your next read. I'm Jill. And I'm Julie. And if you've been watching us, you know we've been traveling across the United States. And this week, we are back home. We are in the Midwest. So books that take place in the Midwest. So Jill, what's your first pick? So my first one, we're going to Indiana. All Good People Here by Ashley <coughs> Flowers. And I want to say, first of all, it doesn't get any more Midwestern or Hoosier than insisting your town is filled to the brim with good people. Because, I mean, that's what they say about the Midwest. We've all heard the shop worn line. Things like that just don't happen here. Not in our nice, tight-knit community. Ashley Flowers, known for her legions of fans as the host of a popular podcast, Crime Junkie, is more than happy to set the record straight in this transporting, fast-paced novels about a murder and memory set in a small town of Wakarusa, Indiana. <laughs> Margot Davies, a Wakarusa native and successful journalist, returns to Indiana to take care of her ailing uncle. Soon she's swept up in the investigation of two murders, one of which took place when she was still a young girl. Spoiler alert, the ending's ambiguous, but it's clear that Margot learns some hard lessons about herself and the pleasures and perils of going home again. All good people here. My first pick also takes place in Indiana. So mine is The Sisters of Summit Avenue by Lynn Cullen. This was published in 2019. She's the best-selling author of Mrs. Poe and Twain's End. And this novel takes place during the Great Depression, and it's about two sisters bound together by love, duty, and pain. Ruth has been single-handedly raising four young daughters and running her family's farm for eight long years, ever since her husband fell into a comatose state infected by the infamous sleeping sickness devastating families across the country. If only she could trade places with her older sister, June, who is the envy of everyone she meets, blonde and beautiful, married to a wealthy doctor, living in a mansion in St. Paul. And June has a coveted job, too, as one of the Bettys, the perky mm -hmm. recipe developers who populate General Mills' famous Betty Crocker Test Kitchen. But these gilded trappings hide sorrows. She has borne no children, and the man she used to love more than anything belongs to Ruth. When the two mm -hmm. sisters reluctantly reunite after a long estrangement, June's bitterness about her sister's betrayal sets into motion a confrontation that's been years in the making. And their mother, Dorothy, who's responsible for bringing them together, has her own dark secrets, which just might blow up in the fragile peace she hopes to restore between her daughters. So if this sounds like an interesting read, it was described as a heartfelt love letter to mothers, daughters, and sisters everywhere. So the sisters of Summit Avenue. My next one is in Wisconsin, Leslie Kagan's Every Now and Then, which was published in 2020. Um, Leslie Kagan has been to a couple of our book festivals here in the Fox Cities, and you might know her from this book, Whistling in the Dark, mm -hmm. which is very popular, and we have, I think we have a couple copies available of that. But this one's a little bit newer. Um, the summer of 1960 was the hottest ever for Summit, Wisconsin. For kids seeking relief from the heat, there was a creek to be swum in, sprinklers to run through, and ice cream at Whitcomb's Drugstore. But for Frankie, Viv, and Biz, 11-year-old best friends, they would forever be remembered as the summer that evil paid a visit to their small town and took their long, long lives as they've known it as a souvenir. With a to-do list in hand, the girls set forth from their hideout to make their mark on that summer. But when three patients escape from Broadhurst Mental Institution, their idyllic lives take a sinister turn. Determined to uncover long-held secrets, the girls have no idea that what they discover could cost them their lives and the only ones they hold dear. Six decades later, Biz remembers that long ago summer and how it still haunts her and her lifelong friends in Every Now and Then, a story about ties that bind forever, the timelessness of guilt and grief, and the everlasting hope for redemption. So, I haven't read that one. I read Whistling in the Dark, and I like that. We're on the same wavelength. My second pick, also a Wisconsin, takes place in Wisconsin, and it's a former BookFest author. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so I have Nicholas Butler's Shotgun Love Songs. Hank, Leland, Kip, and Ronnie were all born and raised in the same Wisconsin town, Little Wing, and are now coming into their own, or not, as husbands and fathers. One of them never left, still farming the family's land that's been tilled for generations. Others did leave, went farther afield to make good, with varying degrees of success. As a rock star, as a commodities trader, as a rodeo stud. And seamlessly woven into their patchwork is Beth, whose presence among them, both then and now, fuels the kind of passion one comes to expect of love songs and rivalries. 
Now, all four are home in hopes of finding what could be real purchase in the world. The result is a shared memory only half recreated, riddled with culture clashes between people who desperately wish to see themselves as the unified tribe they remember, but are confronted with how things have, in fact, changed. It's a remarkable and uncompromising saga that explores the age-old question of whether or not you can ever truly come home again and the kind of steely faith and love returning requires. So check out Shotgun Love Songs by Nicholas Butler. I've read some of his books, but I have not read this one. That cover looks like Wisconsin Town, too. <laughs> so I'm still in Wisconsin. There are other states in the Midwest, but, you know, <laughs> I have a favorite. <laughs> this is the Kindred Spirit Supper Club by Amy Richard. Um, this is a romantic comedy. Jobless and forced home to Wisconsin, journalist Sabrina Monroe can tolerate your unions and frenemies and kisses from old boyfriends, but not the literal ghosts that greet her in this heartwarming tale of the power of love and connection. For Sabrina Monroe, moving back home to the Wisconsin Dells, the self-described water park capital of the world, means returning to the Monroe family curse. The women or family can see spirits who come to them for help with unfinished business. But Sabrina's always redirected the needy spirits to her mom, who's much better suited for the job. The one exception has been Molly, a bubbly, rom-com, loving ghost who's stuck by Sabrina's side all through her lonely childhood. Her personal life starts looking up when Ray, a new local restaurateur, restaurateur, owner of a restaurant, <laughs> invites Sabrina to his supper club where he flirts with her over his famous brandy old fashions. He's charming and handsome, but Sabrina tells herself she doesn't have time for romance. She needs to focus on finding a job. Except the longer she's in the Dells, the harder it is to resist her feelings for Ray, who can turn down a cute guy with a fondness for rescue dogs and obsession for perfecting his fried cheese curd recipe. When the Dell starts to feel like home for the first time and Ray in her corner, Sabrina begins to realize she can make a difference and help others wherever she is. So I don't know what ev this has got everything. It's got the Dells in it. It's got cheese curds. Brandy old fashions. Brandy old fashions. <laughs> I mean, it's a true Wisconsin book. I read that. That was a cute read. I like her books. <laughs> I'm moving out of Wisconsin. I'm moving next door to Michigan in this pick. So this is the women of the copper country. Kind of hard to see. There's a little bit of glare. By Mary Doria Russell. This was published in 2019. It's July 1913, and 25-year-old Annie Clements has seen enough of the world to know that it was unfair. She spent her whole life in the copper mining town of Calumet, Michigan, where men risk their lives for meager salaries and barely enough to put food on the table and clothes on their backs. The women labor in the houses of the elite and send their husbands and son deep underground each day dreading that fateful call of the company man telling them that their loved ones aren't coming home. When Annie decides to stand up for herself and the entire town of Calumet, nearly everyone believes she may have taken on more than she's prepared to handle. In Annie's hands lie the miners' fortunes and their health, her husband's wrath over her growing independence, and her own reputation as she faces the threat of prison and discovers a forbidden love. On her fierce quest for justice, Annie will discover just how much she is willing to sacrifice for her own independence and the families of the town she lives in. Um, from one of the most versatile writers in contemporary fiction, this novel is described as an authentic and moving historical portrait of the lives of the men and women of the earliest 20th century labor movement and a turbulent, violent political landscape that may feel startlingly relevant to today. So check out the women of the Copper Country. It got 4.11 on Goodreads. Wow. So, Michigan. Those people on Goodreads, they know good books. <clears throat> so this is my next one, Patricia Skelka. She writes mysteries in Door County. So we're going up to Door County. This is number three in the series. This is number one if you're one of the purists that need to start with number one, Death Stocks Door County. But I thought this one sounded more timely and fun. So, on a bracing autumn day in Door County, a prominent philanthropist disappears. Is the elderly Gerald Snyder, known as Mr. Packer for his legendary support of the Green Bay football, suffering from dementia or just avoiding his greedy son? Is there a connection to threats against the National Football League? As tourists flood the peninsula for the fall colors, Sheriff Dave Kubiak's search for Snyder is stimmied by the FBI. When human bones wash up on the Lake Michigan shore, the sheriff has more than a missing man to worry about. With the media demanding answers and two puzzles to solve, Kubiak must follow his instincts down the trail of half-remembered rumors and local history to discover the shocking truth. So, yeah. All of these feature this Kubiak guy. He's also in the first one. 
<gasps> I guess he's an investigator from Chicago who winds up in Door County. So, hmm. yeah. My next pick is taking me to Iowa. This is Jane Smiley's A Thousand Acres. This was published back in 1991. Aging Larry Cook announces his intention to turn over his thousand acre farm, one of the largest in Zebulon County, Iowa, to his three daughters, Caroline, Ginny, and Rose. A man of harsh sensibilities, he carves Caroline out of the deal because she has the nerve to be less than enthusiastic about her father's generosity to leave them the farm. While Larry Cook deteriorates into a pathetic drunk, his daughters are left to cope with the often grim realities of life on a family farm. From battering husbands to cutthroat lenders. In this winner of the 1992 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, Jane Smiley captures the essence of such a life with stark, painful details. So if you want a little heavier book, check out A Thousand Acres by Jane Smiley, Pulitzer Prize winner. Ooh. So this next one doesn't only take place in Wisconsin, and it's, but it's one of my favorite books, and it has this scene in it. Neil Gaiman's American Gods. It has a scene in it where they're at the House on the Rock and they have this carousel at the House on the Rock and they make it so spooky and so magical and so fun that I think it's totally worth reading this whole book just to get to that scene. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Anyways, days before his release from prison, Shadow's wife, Laura, dies in a mysterious car crash. Numbly, he makes his way back home. On the plane, he encounters the enigmatic Mr. Wednesday, who claims to be a refugee from a distant war, a former god, and the king of America. Together, they embark on a profoundly strange journey across the heart of the U.S., whilst all around them, the storm of preternatural of epic proportions threatens to break. Scary, <laughs> gripping, and deeply unsettling, American God takes a long, hard look at the soul of America. You'll be surprised, or what and who it finds there. So... There's also like a show on American Gods right now, but I don't know if it has that carousel in it. And hmm. it's a great scene. So, yeah, that's my last pick. <laughs> my last pick, I went to nonfiction. With Halloween coming up, I thought this one might be interesting. It's Haunted Expeditions in the Midwest. Mm. This is by Melissa Clevenger and Craig Nearing. This was published in 2021. Join the authors on their journey into some of the most haunted locations in the Midwest. Hear a story of one of the most notorious crimes in Indiana history. On June 24, 1996, detectives found over 5,000 human bone fragments scattered throughout the property of Fox Hollow Farm. Herb would frequent bars, carefully picking his victims, which would never be seen again. <laughs> the Titanic sinking in 1912 was the big story of the year, until the horrific night of June 13, when a small town in Iowa took center stage. The Villisca Axe Murder House, a place of gruesome murders where the bodies of six children and two adults were found dead in their beds. From a guy wielding an axe. In a night of mixed emotions from happiness to fear, find out what the team experiences during their investigation into that house. In the Sheboygan County Insane Asylum late one night while the team investigates, a blood-curdling scream lasting several minutes is heard. The scream fills the halls and the wing where three female investigators were standing. While they stand their ground, will they stand their ground, or will they run for their lives in terror? Mm -mm. Learn the history of the locations and follow them deep inside some of the scariest places in the Midwest, and feel the terror of what it's like to be a paranormal investigator. So, oh. I had to throw in one nonfiction at the end, and so timely with it being <laughs> October, you can see all the haunted places. Exactly. Well, we <laughs> hoped we helped you find something to read if you're not going very far. <laughs> You can find our videos on our Facebook page and on our Kimberly Public Library website. We were saying our viewership is down. We hope you guys are still enjoying our videos. Let us know what you're reading. If you have a topic that you'd like us to pursue, we'd be happy to do book recommendations about that. And until next time, we thank you for watching. Bye! Bye.